8353. All members of the committee are present. First order of business is approval of the minutes from various uh, recess meetings and special meetings. So move. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Um, item D. Um, we're going to talk about these items now and then go into closed session to discuss them further. Okay. Um, item two is a resolution to consider a development agreement buying between Chris Hansen Incorporated and the city of West Dallas. And along with that, item three, discussion relative to the creation of a tax incremental financing district, 18 South 92nd and Lapham for Chris Hansen. Patrick? Mr. Chairman. Um, not chairman, is it? Chairman. Yeah, yeah that's correct. Right. Um, you might recall Chris Hansen um, on 92nd and Maple or 92nd and um, uh, Lapham has acquired a number of properties that have gone through the process of rezoning. Um, the company was preparing for uh, a future expansion. They've also acquired the Knights of Columbus located here on the, the left side of your screen. Um, they're, they're looking to possibly, you know, attract additional investment to the site from Denmark. And when we were talking with the company as city representatives and looking to attract that investment and also jobs to our community, we worked out a, a development agreement to help foster some investment here at the site. The first phase would be uh, a $25 million addition that would be located to the west of the, the company, and this would be around 25 to 30 jobs. The value of that um, um, addition would be around five million taxable. The area that you see in the yellow is an area that could be considered for future development when the company decides to pursue that. This is the way the company currently looks. Um, this is an area looking south at the site and then when they add on the addition you see it be on the right hand of your screen um, adding on um, more distribution and, and, and more production space to Where's the Knights site. Where's Knights of Columbus in that photo it's, right there? It would there. be to the right. Okay. Um, that's generally where the, the expansion is. This mouse didn't work. And the, right here, right yeah. here, right here is, is Knights of Columbus. Of Columbus. Okay. Correct. And this building yep. will take part of it, uh, the parking lot at access from there. So in the terms of the development agreement, um, the phase, like I mentioned, is 25 million, 20,000 square foot addition. Um, if there was a phase two, it could be estimated around $40, 000, $40 million um, potential, potential of 100 jobs total. The timeline is to demolish the Knights of Columbus by December 31st, construct the phase two and have it operational by December 31st of 2022. And then uh, if, if they depended on growth and investment from De Denmark's board of directors, because this company is based out of Denmark, if they decide to do future growth here, the timeline and the way the development is written that we provide incentive if they start that development before 2025. Uh, the other condition of the development agreement is a developer funded TIF. They would like access to tax increment financing. Um, this would be available but not only for the first phase but if they have any other future phases at the site. For example, if, if they create five million in taxable value, they could generate 1.39 million and, and, and taxes over a 12 year period. The development agreement states that after the start of each phase, we would provide 12 years of increment um, from the TIF district. So they have to perform to get the value, the benefit of the ta tax increment financing district. So this is the pay go type of concept. The things that we would take out of the increment that is gained is 45,000 to start the TIF and then annual uh, 25,000 for administration of that TIF. So these are the general terms of the development agreement. So if you looked at this, this is the way it generally looks. 25 million in development value, taxable value is around 5 million, the tax increment would be around 1.4 that Chris Hansen would experience over the time period that would, was negotiated in the development agreement. We'll talk about the balance of, uh, of the, the development agreement in closed session. So you're saying out of the $25 million development that they would invest, by the time they're done with it, the taxable value that it creates yes. is $5 million? Correct. Okay. $5 million real estate, $20 million equipment. Yeah, there's a lot of equipment in there. That you don't exactly, yeah. I don't know if you've been through there, but everything is stainless steel. And it, it, no, but I've seen pictures. Yeah, 
Yeah. So it's very expensive equipment. Just to note, this is their U.S. headquarters. So mm -hmm. this is an expansion of a bioscience business that in the United States or in the world, um, every other piece of cheese that's eaten today is influenced by Chris Hansen. So they have a huge global impact, and within the last, I think, year or two, they were ranked the world's most sustainable business. Um, by the, there's a group that does climate things, and they recognize them as being the world's most sustainable, and that's something that they take great pride in as a company. We'll talk more about this in the closed session. Oh, what about the TIF? That pretty much sums up the discussion okay. on the TIF. Okay. Um, item four is resolution to consider an amendment number one. Amendment to the site plan to the development agreement bind between the City of West Ellis and developers West Quarter East LLC and West Quarter West LLC regarding the 70th Street Quarter Development Project. Yeah. Mr. Chair, uh, all that we're doing is we're going to amend the master plan, particularly on the east side of, of, the, of the road. Uh, this was going to be the hotel on the northeast corner, northwest corner. And now they're going to move it to the back. And these all had underground parking and with offices above. The new plan moves the hotel to the south. And then these will be all office buildings with the parking structure servicing all of them in the back. And there will be some uh, surface parking around the hotel and around these developments. But technically, all that we're doing today is amending the master plan. Oops. If you have any questions, so <clears throat> let me go into more detail in closed session. Um, item five on the agenda is discussion relative to the redevelopment of 11111 West Greenfield Avenue, the for former Pick and Save building. We've been working with uh, a couple of developers trying to put a project together for a, a major tenant that has not been released yet, uh, but we'll talk more about this in the closed session. So what we're going to do, probably create a TIF to help underwrite some of the costs, and we'll explain the rationale for that later. Uh, item six, the resolution and considered a Beloit Road Management Agreement buying between Beloit Senior Housing LLC and Ogden and Company. This is just for informative pers um, information to the, the committee here. Um, Beloit Road Senior Housing is, it has been owned by the City of West Dallas. We own point one something percent of that property today. We've contracted out a few years ago with Cardinal Capital to provide management, tax credit compliance, etc. Um, this is a movement once we looked at the efficiency and how we could maybe save the city dollars and operational costs. We're, we're looking at property management as being private, property maintenance being private. We've actually, this balance of this year, contracted out with a firm to provide the grounds, grass cutting, trimming, mulching, etc. at the site. Um, snow and ice removal, ground maintenance, and then, like I said, the, the low-income housing tax credit compliance. We put all those together in RFP, and we had two respondents, uh, Mercy and Ogden, and the committee decided to pursue with Ogden. At the end of the day, on the budget perspective, we looked to see maybe around $17,000 in savings. But I say that because it, it's questionable if we get a big heavy snowfall, it could really impact your budget. Um, as well as they factored in a uh, vacancy percentage into their budget, and if they achieved the, low, the quicker turnover that we could obtain through this private operation, there's chances that we could then make up additional money. Right now with Public Works, it takes a few days or weeks and sometimes months to get a unit ready, um, depending on vacations and who's available to go over to service the unit. If it's privatized, they have their connections and umbrella services. They can get somebody in there, get that unit painted in a day, and get it back on the market. So that, that's our goal. The Mercy Group was out of Chicago. They have one building here in the Milwaukee metro area. Ogden's got 200 buildings. That's so we felt more comfortable that they'd be able to provide a better quality service to our residents. So generally the CDA oversees this agreement. We brought it to you, to you for your information because of the city's relationship to Bullitt Road Senior we House. Have a we'll just, here. I know. I, I did. We'll just place that on file. Okay. I didn't think it had to come before the council. Yeah, but it, you it, have it, a resolution I, in here. So. Patrick wasn't around. We have that. a breakdown on the. Um, can you show them the budget? Um, the. the uh, you have to bring up the last night's PowerPoint. Oh, you don't have that. Well, we can get. We can get that. Just bear with me one second. Uh, I guess the committee should know how much we were spending with public works and. That's on that worksheet that we got attached to here, right? 
That's what you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Okay, you got that. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at that today. <clears throat> so if you looked at the, the budget, this is the actual cost that we've been incurring at Beloit Road. Um, the grounds and maintenance, if you everything combined, is around 153. 477 an actual expense in 2018 um, they have this amount but they also have stat additional staff that they would hire to provide grounds in, in keeping so that's why you see personnel is a higher expense so um, this is our personnel and, and costs so but um, it would provide us additional savings at the complex but all the services that typically are performed by public works a lot of them are contracted out and then build to the property so we hope to obtain you know better efficiency and, and um, savings by that measure and though this management firm will pay those invoices right now everything is to get paid through public or our finance department or in coordinated through public works we should receive a, you know considerable staff time savings by going through this privatization so Peggy can I ask you um, apparently we're gonna be saving a little over three hundred thousand dollars in, in cost mostly in public works um are we going to be reducing some personnel there because of this so there are some positions open in public works right now really the profit if you will that um Beloit road gets from the work that's done is only about between 125 and 175 thousand okay. a year so that was basically the hole you might say in our budget from them not doing this work any longer. Well, we had a number of positions in the public works department that were open anyway that were not being filled for a number of years. Is that included in that? Correct, when you say but the 125 to 175, and the reason I give a range is because um, in recent years they haven't been having enough time to do as much work because they've had more vacancies in public works. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, like two to three years ago, they were doing about $175,000 worth of work for the light road. We will not be getting that revenue anymore. So we have to then tighten our belt on the expenditure side of public works to That's make sure I mean. that works. And it's okay. about 125 to 175 is the ramification there. Okay, so there will be some reduction of public works. Right. There are, just, just a, a special note, we did ask public works to provide the refuse pickup right. and see if they, they can bill us for it mm -hmm. as a property, as a revenue, that they can keep that revenue then versus us contracting out the light road to do that and also to provide the recycling well recycling they, do they think they have to do it already based on the ordinance so yeah. mr chairman um mr. peggy um because we have openings we're not going to have to eliminate people we're just not going to fill up positions that were open correct i think over time there's going to be some attrition where maybe a position that we have currently right now wouldn't need to be filled but it's not um, terminating any positions okay yeah, we're not laying anybody okay. off. That's where I would want to make typically sure. been the council uh, okay. policy here, unwritten policy. But, okay. you know, we don't we try to do it through attrition. Oh, cool. So, so Mr. Chair, so for the, the net profit for the Beloit housing last year was a hundred and some thousand dollars? No. No? No. No, it, it's... Beloit it, Road paid the city that much for yeah. the services that we performed. See, some of them were contracted out. Yes. So it was just a matter of paying a bill. But the other ones, they were paying our public works folks to do that work. Yes. That will not happen anymore. Okay. So they charge Bullet Road for providing a service, right. and we pay that. Public Works rents. needs to go in and, and cut the grass and, and yes. plow the snow and maintain the inside of the buildings, paint the apartments, all that right. stuff. And the Public Works, the budget will be reduced by a commensurate amount. So many. Yeah, and they would. So many, all the other factors that go into it. Right. Okay. Yeah, so. That's fine. And it should free up staff to do other work around oh, the city. Right. Okay. Instead of having an electrician go out and fix a light bulb, we'll have that electrician available to do street lights. Some street lights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's all we're talking about, street lights. I think that's been predetermined already. <laughs> oh, if you yeah, want to move to place that one on file, we can oh, do it. You want to do it right now? Like sure, we, we can do it. Well, we got so it. moved. Okay. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried.
so that we could go back and close the shirt up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Item seven is a uh, discussion relative to financial request by West Dallas Community Child Care LLC for the location at 6682 West Greenfield. Mr. Chairman, uh, West Dallas Community Child Care actually has two locations in West Dallas. One is located in the 1126 building on South 70th Street, and they also have one located at 6682 West Greenfield Avenue. This is Lo Blast. You might recall we worked with them to move into this location. And this is, a, this is from their website, their play area located on the east side of this building. Unfortunately, Google didn't drive back here, so it's hard to get that picture or an aerial of it. But this is the property that's owned by the CDA, that's 6610, the old payroll office of Olive Chalmers. So this is located just to the north of that area. They are looking to consolidate operations into this location. Um, this is part of the Cobalt redevelopment on South 70th Street. And they have a lease option that goes until next July. Um, but they could move into this location and consolidate, and they've asked for a financial assistance, and that's what we'll talk about in closed session. Who owns that building? This is owned by Summit Summit. Place. That's what I thought. Um, item 8, discussion relative to the property located at 10620 West Greenfield Avenue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a... Uh, uh, Burger King restaurant, uh, the ground under the Burger King is owned by uh, Casa Investment, and Burger King owns the building, and then Burger King owns the lot to the, the uh, west of it. And Burger King just re-upped their lease for four years. So this uh, is the we're trying to get somebody to get in there to revitalize it, but because the titles are all in so many different hands, it's made everybody difficult to try to get to communicate with everybody to make it work. Our city attorney <coughs> came up with this proposal to do a land contract where we don't technically buy the property, but we have it by, on a land contract so that we can get control of it, work with the owner to clean up the property, or at least get the owner to sell it to, to us or somebody else, uh, not to us. We want to sell it to a developer to get, so we all get out of it. Uh, and the, uh, the owners are willing to, to work with us on doing it. The owners of the land are willing to do it, work with us on that. On that. In that, uh, they're getting about $2,900 a month in rent from Burger King, uh, which is, effectively wasted, uh, but so uh, they would pay it, that to, uh, pay it to us as the new owner of, under a land contract, and then we would pay that to the current owner, uh, CASA Investment, as part of our payment for the property. So it's just a wash of mud, uh, funds. One thing that the owners of the property mentioned is that they're going to have to pay a real estate commission and closing costs to, to about $40,000. And if we, if we can walk away from this at any time, if this doesn't work, and then they're going to have to spend an, another 40000 to get somebody else to, to do that. And they said, they'll work with us, but they don't want to lose money to us to work with us. So effectively, it's going to cost us about $40,000 to try to make this thing work. Now, we'll also uh, make that as a down payment uh, so that we'll reduce the $400,000 to three hundred and sixty, dollars And then hopefully we can sell it for more and, and recoup our money. But even if we don't recoup our money, at least we get it back into productive reuse. This is an interesting way that the city attorney has come up with to try to provide this option. I've got to answer any questions. Mr. Chair, the uh, real estate gets the uh, $40,000, that's for commission? Yes, the owner gets that. The owner gets that, then they'll pay their brokers okay. and their closing costs. On, like on the uh, land contract, do you have to pay? Broker, most of it's brokerage commission. Yeah. You, have, you have to pay that, right? Yeah, we don't. But in a, there's no closing costs, right? What well, there still about? is some closing costs related to the legal documents they're recording. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah. Okay. Most right. of that 40000 is real estate commission. Okay. And then, Mr. Chairman, once we have it, Burger King pays us. Because right. we are now the yeah. Yeah. Then we pay so Burger King the owner. pays us. Pay the owner. Right. That, that's our payment for yeah. The land so contract. That so part's a wash. So yeah, just that right. forty thousand so, is what right. we're. So pay forty thousand, yep. and then after that, Burger King pays us, and we pay, pay the landowner, yep. and so it's a wash. There is no more city money involved um, at that point until such time as the lease expires, and then some decisions have to be made. Correct. Well, hopefully we can get that resolved 
before that, I before at least so. expiring. But because we, it, we have to anticipate that that's not going to happen. Right. The idea here is that we could find, if we have access to the lease, them that they're not in compliance with their lease. Worst case is, so. it's a land contract. We walk away. Right. We don't lose anything except the forty thousand dollars, and um, and we've got the option there if, if we can get somebody to develop it, we can do something. The idea is if we have access to that lease and, and Burger King, then we can negotiate on that western parcel and try to get a combined site for development. Right. And have the city attorney's pressure on Burger King and the Whopper and uh, <laughs> and um, try to get them to pay attention to this property. You, well, you would think that Burger King would be happy to walk away from a 200 and... Well, you know, we're that thinking would be that the initial phone calls that we'd like to offer you an opportunity to save money. Right. Isn't this we're thinking that they're so big that they might somebody's somebody's not they're not paying pay attention. attention. Isn't this a franchise owner that owns this? It, it's a corporate store. Is it's it really? Store? Yeah, I thought really. the guy in, mailed, I thought uh, the guy in uh, <coughs> Howie Hundred owned it. Well, we mailed Miami, and oh. then uh, I think now it's, yeah. it's they're in it's Canada. Out. Yeah, the the local Burger Kings are not. I mean, the one on 70, 67th and the the other one in Highway Hundred don't have anything to do with this one at all. Really? Yeah. I no, thought that separate, guy owned this. I thought he owned all three. Yeah. yeah. And, there, and he used to own one in, in uh, New Berlin, which yeah. turned into a Taco Bell or something. <laughs> We've talked to a number of real estate brokers, and they oh. have informed us that there is interest. They have in, there's a lot of people that have interest in the building. Right. But they can't, they're not selling the building. When they put the for sale sign, everyone's yeah. going to get into the building. Well, they can't get into the building because that's Burger King's. Um, and Burger and King. then, the, then the parking that you need for that use of that building is located to the west, and that's owned by another, another entity. Property. So if, if they said, that's if you can get this put together, I mean, other people have tried, and a lot of brokers, you might have seen it, the site for sale for some time, other than Anderson Group. There's been other brokers. They they have given up because they can't get hold of Burger King. Burger King doesn't, you know, there's so-and-so's interest. Burger King never responded. So this this is something that we're going, we're going to have to, you know, put some little sweat into it to get, Burger King to respond. So the city get involved is more respond. They're more right. responsive to the city. <laughs> for the entity right. that currently has it, there is nothing for them to really want to pursue anything, gotcha. because they get a rent income from the property, and Burger King mm -hmm. pays all the taxes and has to maintain the site. Yeah. Lately, it's been us maintaining the site. And we bill them, and we bill them, and they pay it. And you can yeah. see here's the assessed values of those parcels. So, but yeah, Burger King gets the tax bill, and they pay the rent, and they're. In Technically, when they don't cut the weeds and things, we send our crew out there and we put it on the tax bill. So, and they pay the uh, they pay the taxes. I mean, it's this is not, in terms of economics, this site is pretty not, well situated. It's right at one of the busiest intersections in the whole Metro Milwaukee area. Now, why Burger King doesn't have a Burger King there, I don't know, but. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there could be a lot of different issues, but hopefully this can help mitigate this issue and get it to a vibrant use. Mr. Chair, will we put this on the agenda as a resolution to authorize the $40,000 expenditure right now? It's just on there as a discussion. For discussion, right. So you'll have it at least at the next recess meeting. Mr. Um, Chair, if I could ask, there is a term limit uh, for the uh, land contract, uh, five years, 20 years? Uh, it's actually... 30 some years, whatever it some takes years. to pay it off. It's, okay. it's, it's all theoretical. In four years, something will happen because their lease expires. Lease expires. Okay. And then, as we understand, the, the building goes to ownership of the land. Now we still got to buy the other lot, but there's hopefully we'll have it done resolved before then. Okay, great. Within the next year, 18 months is my guess. Can you want to go into the full session now? <coughs> we could phase this agenda or go to closed session. Whatever, whatever, you whatever your pleasure. We're going to run through it. Then we'll okay, we'll session. go through the agenda and then go back and go into full session. Um, item 9 on the agenda is discussion relative to family self sufficiency grant from the Housing and Urban Development in the amount of $72,000 relative to Housing Choice Voucher Program. Mr. Okay. Chairman, we, uh, our housing division, uh, Mel, Poppy, <laughs> and our took a lead on looking at a grant to help Section 8 participants improve their financial situation by either obtaining a GED, upskilling, or getting education. We applied for a grant through HUD that provides funding to communities to help organize participants to go get these services. And then also address the issue of if they improve their situation, 
and they lose a port that financial assistance that's their rent assistance that they don't have the fear of getting the, improving their situation so at the end of if they go and get education and they get a better financial situation instead of losing their rent assistance the month that they is adjusted will be put in the savings to help them when they graduate from the family self self sufficiency program the idea here is to get participants off of section 8 and then improve their situation um, so we're looking at outside consulting services to see if they can help with some of the administration of this but it's a $72,000 grant that we would receive from HUD and we're putting this on tonight's agenda just as information is one of the strategic goals of the city is to help people who are low to moderate income in different sensitive populations in our community and we see this as a, a true benefit to help a number of our participants work towards a better situation would we run this program then we're not it, sure yet we'll come back to you with that we're going to try and get it outside of the city to, to run it but if we have to we will but we're going to try and get somebody else to do it some outside agency that might be better suited to do this kind of work than us I'm almost wondering if we don't go to an outside agency and do it here just because of an outside agency just taking the money and not running it efficiently that's my concern and we're going to look at Kenosha is doing this. We're going to look at their model. We do, we don't have a predisposed idea how we want to run this. We weren't sure we'd even get this, but uh, we may if we get 25 people under a program this year, uh, we might be able to get another allocation to get another 25. Our, our goal is to get everybody off Section 8. Is that what we really like to do, or at least get them making much more money so our the public assistance is less. Is it kind of the idea to get them involved in like maybe MATC here in West Dallas? We've, we we uh, reached out to MATC, the school district, uh, Empower, Employ Milwaukee, um, big, uh, big Step program, pre programs that are providing job training, but we have to even step it a little bit further. Some of their participants don't, haven't even graduated from high school. Oh, so, so I mean, we have, it's a, it's a, it's a thing to improve their personal life so they get the skills. It could be a matter of helping someone with a resume. It could be a matter of helping with just the interview process. Right. Getting them connected to a kind of a, a processing interview and then figure out what we can do to work with that individual. And there's probably okay. people that are much better suited than you are to do that. Right. You know, because you're looking at we people met with that specialize in doing resumes and interviews and that type of thing, which I'm sure there's some maybe some of our people in HR have that expertise right. but and a couple of them might be even be <coughs> like for example it might this might be even a different logic um, Wibic which provides sure. training to help do a business plan yeah. there might be someone that can just <coughs> jump into owning a business or working towards a small business we launched Kiva recently right. that's another program yeah. I mean the idea is just to help improve their financial situation it can happen in many different perspectives Wibic also has a program that it's a financial awareness program and how to save and then at the end there's some money that's provided to the individual and they graduate from that course so there's there's different ways we can do this so. how will the people be chosen um, one will start just simply by interest okay. um, we'll ask and, the volunteers who wants to who on the section 8 program the idea though is you know when people hear oh I, I have to go do this and then I could possibly lose my federal assistance that motivating factor gets a little challenged. We don't want to have them lose that motivation factor. This is a good thing. So the program is to help balance that so that they don't see that issue happening with them. Any further discussions or questions? <coughs> Item 10, it's a resolution to consider an extension of time request for the letter of intent agreement with Capri Restaurant Group for reunion located at 6610 West Greenfield. Uh, that's the building that the city purchased. Uh, it was going to be bought by uh, a Jiffy Loop or something like that, tear it down and put one of those little things in there. But we got a great buyer, Capri. Uh, it's going to open up a new style American restaurant. Uh, and their closing is projected for late November. So what, what we need to do is extend our uh, letter of intent with them. And we'd like to amend it to, it was going to be 60 days, but we'd like to make it 90 days so that we can get to the end of November. Are we acting on that? Yes, that we can act on. Yep. I'll move up for a Second. As amended, yes. to make it 90 days instead yes. of 60, if you would, please. Also, it saves us from coming back. Yep. Cities help me now, aren't they? Pardon? 
the city is helping them. Yep. Yes. We own the building now, right. and we're going to sell right. it to them. Yeah, we'll come it. back with those financial requests. We'll also be making them some. You made the motion? Yeah, I made the motion. Right. 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 Yeah. We'll also be making them some loans. Mm -hmm. what, uh, was was it amended, or do we have to vote on an amendment to extend no, it from no, 60 to 90? We moved it and made a motion we'll as amended. amended. I didn't know if it has been amended. It hasn't been amended. Yes. It still says 60 in here. So I make yes, a motion sir. to amend it to 90? Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And on the resolution as amended, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, then we have um, item 11. That's a resolution to consider an extension of time request for letter of intent agreement with Baum Re Revision LLC Group for property at 6771 West National and potentially portions of 67 Star Star West Mitchell. Mr. Chair, uh, this is similar to, to the previous one where they're going to need more time to be able to get there. Uh, they've done the phase one, uh, which is to t determine if the, f if the project is uh, historically enough to be eligible for historic tra tax credits, and that's why we took off some of that aluminum siding. The state has said that it, they recommend that it is. It's gone into the state. The state's got about not, the feds. I mean, they've got the National Park Service has got about another five days to tell us whether it is or isn't. We're assuming they're going to say it is. And then the owner then has to go through the prepare all the detailed plans and specifications for construction. They actually get building permits and all that, <clears throat> and then uh, submit that to the national register, and then they'll approve. And it's about up to four million dollars, two million dollars for the Fed uh, National Park Service, and two million for the state in, for just from the historic tax credits. And we'll be putting new market tax credits in this as well. But to make this event center, and then uh, the, our entrepreneurial areas that we want to be opening up, and our community kitchen uh, and some other food maker areas. We want to keep the rents as low as possible so that this thing can run and run without any further public assistance. And so we recommend that this be extended for 60 days, but also in there, we, the, the executive director has, uh, the director of development has the authority to extend to another extend 30, so you don't have to come back. Is that written in there? Yeah. Move for approval. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carry. Uh, Eleven item twelve. This discussion relative to ordinance to repeal and recreate section twelve point four five, the M one manufacturing district of the RMC, and to create a new subsection called industrial districts with light industrial district and heavy industrial district. Definitions being updated in section 12.06 of the RMC relative to certain industry industrial uses. As we have been discussing previously, we've got to create a new zoning district to make it really heavy industrial and light <coughs> industrial. And that this is that process. And Steve is going to take us through how, how we got there and where we're going to go. And then we have some options that we're going to need you to weigh in on as to what do you think should be M2, the heaviest industrial. We're going to assume everything is going to be in heavy zoning unless they can prove otherwise. Uh, but so we've got some policy issues that will also need to be resolved in election. <coughs> into that. Steve? Thank you, John and Mr. Chairman. Um, so as John articulated, the difference right now is that we currently have just one manufacturing district in the city, the M1 district. What we propose to do is create a light industrial and a heavy industrial. So we'll have an M1 and an M2. Um, the, the main idea is to sort of separate the range of different types of industrial uses we have, everything from, say, uh, a, a unit drop forge to a, a self-storage facility, and maybe parse those out into different districts. Um, so what the ordinance is, is going to accomplish is to provide some language updates in terms of dash definitions. It's going to become more of a user-friendly document with the use of charts and visual aids, um, rather than just long laundry lists of permitted and special uses. There's going to be a consideration of the two um, light and heavy industrial districts. And what's going to come back to you in the future um, uh, overall will be the overall zoning ordinance update. Um, that'll be down the road. We're currently working with uh, Kale on that, our city attorney. And then that'll also feature some interactive online functions and mapping capabilities for, for the future. <coughs> but tonight's discussion is really just based on that M1, M2 light and heavy industrial. 
So what is the M1 uh, light industrial mean? Um, basically lower intensity uses, um, ranging from research and development, your typical warehousing and distribution, self-storage facilities, some light fabrication and assembly of products. In general, though, it's, it's not something that you'd be uh, in, you know, adverse to living nearby or uh, across the street from. Um, the difference, though, with them, two heavier industrial districts is that they're typically larger scale facilities, higher intensity, of course, places with forging or castings, concrete batch plants, waste treatments, the types of things you wouldn't really want to live too close to because there could be some smoke, noise, vibrations uh, that could uh, uh, challenge your, your enjoyment of your property. Um, so what the ordinance is going to do is rather than, you know, if you've ever looked at our zoning orders right now, there's permitted uses and there's special uses and it's just listed out in a long, probably about 15 pages to get through the uh, <coughs> various districts. Um, but we're going to break it into a table. We'll have the M1 district, the M2 district, and then the, the designation if it's a special use, a P for if it's a permitted use. Um, eventually, we're going to probably change this to say conditional instead of special, but we'll get to that in the future. And then categorize, come up with subcategories of manufacturing and industrial uses, wholesale distribution uses, and then list those various uses underneath those categories. And then, so for instance, if you take a look at a batch plant, you know, places like uh, that asphalt, concrete, stone processing, it would not be allowed in an M1 zoning district. It may be there currently, but if we're looking at the future districting of M1 and M2, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't occur in an M1 any longer. They would occur in, in, a, in, a, in an M2 district. And we'll show you the district considerations in a moment. This other column here is some use standards that we're uh, going to be introducing to the table as well. Um, now, many, some of our uses currently um, have, have use standards. It's just worked into the, into the ordinance within the um, section. But we'll have specific use standards sort of spelled out. So when you click on this, it would bring you to the actual standards that apply to a batch plant or an asphalt plant. Um, basically, general standards that would, would apply to this specific type of use. Um, we want to make sure that there's precautions, reasonable precautions, whether it be site and landscaping minimums or area requirements, distance requirements, separations from, from residential. Um, in the case of a batch plant, we want to make sure that they're using water, but, you know, they have some separation in terms of their outdoor storage and, and dust measures, control measures. So that, that's all going to be included within the ordinance. Um, so taking a look at the overall, this is the existing zoning map, and the darker purple areas here are the existing M1 zoning districts. Highlighted here in yellow are the conceptual locations for future M2 heavy industrial areas. Um, so the east side of the city, um, near Teledyne, the old Teledyne site. This is our waste transfer station here, and then there's some uh, other existing industrial. And then this is the unit drop forge area here. This is the uh, uh, Siemens, Avalon Rail, Toshiba, uh, former Alice Chalmers properties here. And then in the northwest corner of the city, this is the Zignagos, Elite <laughs> Environmentals, uh, Pablocki pavings, uh, and that, that sort of thing. So just taking a closer look, now if we just, this, this map just shows purely the existing industrial areas within the city. Uh, currently there's 11, about 1,100 acres of um, manufacturing zoning within the city. Um, we would be introducing about 175. Now these conceptual areas that I just shown um, are highlighted now in, in yellow here. It would represent about 175 um, acres of, of M2. Now that's just of existing land that's already zoned industrial. Uh, this the M2 would be uh, wouldn't be converting anything from commercial to industrial. It's purely just already industrial land or an industrial use, and creating 175 acres of of the uh, new M2 district. <coughs> so just taking a closer look, this is on the east side of the city. The um, uh, AC equipment services. This is. Motor castings here, Greenfield Avenue, the town center. So there's some considerations that we're taking a look at of what could be M2 in this area. Initially, we were thinking this area, but it could be expanded to include also the uh, Summit Place um, 
Blast Technology. Blast Technologies and uh, Toshiba. Oh, save the industry. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's an appropriate area. I mean, it's it's located. I mean, everywhere in West Dallas is centrally located, but it's, it's <coughs> off the expressway. It's historically had a manufacturing past. There is some separation that that would still be uh, met with some separation from the neighborhoods. So we feel that's one consideration. Is motor costumes in there? In this in this concept here, it's not. Um, so and, and and this is all open for discussion. You know, as we get into so the ordinance is going to be one part, and that's what's been um, presented before the council over the summer. The other part is going to be the mapping ordinance, which would then be a separate exercise in districting these M2 areas. Um, and that would come back for um, plan commission and council consideration as well. I think yesterday we were talking about it with Tom. We want to put motor castings in there. So okay. when we come back, we'll have this amended to have motor castings in there. Depending on what goes in there, we could always change it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that is my point. And I made the point yesterday. I think that when we're looking at rezoning these uh, to M1s, you have to keep in mind, once you get it down to M1, if you have a heavy industry that wants to move in there and it might be a suitable location, you're going to have a hell of a time rezoning it back up to M2. Right. So I'd rather err on the side of leaving it the way it is, except for those parcels that we know are, we don't want ever to be, they're not M2 now, right. and you know, they're, they're zoned manufacturing, but they're not being used for heavy manufacturing. And maybe those we can look at that are adjacent to more residential areas and make them M1s, and certainly like the ones along Highway 100 where mm -hmm. you probably don't want heavy manufacturing anymore. Um, you want them to be the, the lighter manufacturing. Sure. But I'd rather err on the side of, hey, let's reduce it when we see fit and not try to limit someone's chance for expansion of a, of a heavy industry or, or anything like that. I want to keep those places in business. Okay. Uh, Unit drop forge, um, and then also this is that uh, waste transfer station. Uh, this is the former Teledyne site. But the areas that we've indicated, or at least delineated in this on this map, would be 24 acres, including the waste transfer station, and then these uh, existing facilities here. I think Coakley Brothers. There's a staffing agency and two other uh, industrial buildings south of that. So, um, and the reason this is dashed, I guess we were looking at it from the standpoint of it is an existing heavy industrial use, unit drop forage. Um, and it's just going to be a consideration. If you want it, M2, it doesn't have to be. I mean, they could continue to operate as they always have as an M1, even after the, the ordinance changes. It just would mean that they couldn't expand outside of this, this property boundary um, and put another drop forage, say, over here. Um, they'd have to keep it within that property boundary. Uh, and then this is on the northwest corner of the city. This is I-94 here in the north. And then uh, 64 acres uh, conceptually shown here. Um, Signago, Lead Environmental, Poblaki, um, Industries for the Blind. Uh, there's some roofing companies. Um, and then also, you know, you could consider adding on some additional areas here along Adler, north of Adler Lane and north of Dixon Street um, as a consideration. Um, so. Uh, in total, though, um, uh, you know, about 175 acres were shown uh, there in concept. Um, and um, you know, this, so it did, did go before the Planning Commission. The, uh, the text amendments did go before Planning Commission in May. Uh, <coughs> public hearing was conducted June 18th. And the next step is going to be council consideration on the 5th. Um, and we'll, we're, open, we're open for ideas and discussion. Well, what are you looking for on the 5th? Well, the fifth would be um, basically that uh, our, our table. Um, if I go back, to just the table. The, not, not the not table. Looking at the at, at the map. The mapping. Taking. The mapping is a separate. Um, okay, that's entity what I wanted to entirely. Make sure. so yeah. Not. So we'll have. You'll still have time um, after, if you approve the the text amendments on November fifth, you'll still have time. We'll still have time to consider, and maybe have open houses and discuss with affected property owners. Yeah, because anybody that's affected, you may be getting phone calls like crazy from. Yeah. People questioning what's going on, why is it going, why are you, why are you changing my zoning? Um, so you're going to have a lot of businesses questioning that. That's oh. why I'm, I'm saying we, my opinion is we should pretty much leave it the way it is and, and attack them on a case by case basis slowly rather than try to do a, a, a big thing. And, and that's kind of what we're looking for for direction is 
what Alderman Lysak has suggested is that whatever is currently a M2 type use, leave it that. Right. And then uh, we need some guidance from you of what to do. If that's your guidance, that's what we'll do. Then we'll send out letters to all the 390 <coughs> some industries uh, with a letter explaining what we're doing and that we're going to have an open house to discuss this, that sort of thing. But we need you to tell us at some point in time what do you think that should be to at least start with and then we'll go <coughs> get public input and then you can reevaluate it after that. A good example you said was motor castings. That should stay where it's at right now. Mm -hmm. And then if we get somebody that comes in and says, hey, we want to put in a light industry there, Great. then you then change it to them, then yeah. you rezone it. Yeah. Steve, Steve, you mentioned about the unit forging. Yeah. We're going to leave it as M2. Yeah, and that's exactly the direction I'm hearing this evening. Yes, yeah, that's Leave that's it as what M2 so we'll, you know, we'll take this dash line nervous, off it. And, you know, some of those businesses, yeah. you know, really. You know, yeah, has there been any talk of, from them that they want to expand eventually, or do they still <laughs> really keep good with what they're they got? I think they're okay with what they have. I mean, if, of course, I mean, if they wanted to expand, they could. I mean, they would have to, they have a, I guess a parking lot across the street. Um, they have they could well, expand within their confines yeah, of their existing property. Yeah, they're you know, place. Yeah, and, and you never know. Well, yeah. Companies change dramatically in this yeah. day and age. Right. They may decide that we don't want to just make forgings; we want to machine them. Right. right. And that's not a, it's a heavy use, but it's not as objectionable use as a drop forge. Yeah. So you know, yeah. you want to leave that option open for them. Well, when I keep when I keep in mind the heavy industry I think of where I work yeah you know, we've got big machines yep. now we don't we don't do pounding and drop forging no, but, but we still heavy, bring in heavy big industry. pieces of equipment that's yeah. machine you got big trucks coming in right. with steel and yeah absolutely right but the unit forging that's finished too? machining too, I had the, you know? we had the same thing right yeah. it was an operation I would unit forging that's finished machining too yeah. you know yeah they, they, yeah so you never know they may expand their yeah, they have talked about any more CNC machines. Yeah, machine even with that. the yeah. I mean, that yeah, they have it, but the other buildings. I wish they would. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Single family yeah. residential across yeah. the street. And, yeah. and, so, and if you've got big yeah. pieces that are in there, that would, to me, that would be considered the heavy industry. It's currently empty. But yeah. Yeah. You know, another example of what I brought up the other day was Wisconsin Nipple here in your district. You know, we backed by the railroad track some of the 90th street. That's my district years ago. Yeah. And, you know, it's a heavy industry tucked into a residential neighborhood right. that it's zoned heavy and I you know you don't want to see them run out of town. Is exactly. Wisconsin Nipple will that be an M two? Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah. yeah it's gotta definitely. be an Steve, did you kill Oh yeah, it's on the on the on the end of the I think it might even have a let me just it's on the railroad. I track. might have a uh, slide for it here. So it's gonna be oh here we go. This is the one. So it's um this is eighty ninety second street I'm sorry, 84th, 92nd, so they're on 89th at the end of 89th Street, and I believe they are right in this area. This is Chris Hansen. Yeah. And then so uh, Weedor Chemical is here, and then across the street you've got the uh, Wisconsin Nipple Fitting. Yeah. And so those, the those hydraulic shop down the down Yeah, 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 the yeah. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Crawls, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so but those are, those are, stay heavy those are likely, uh, Definitely uh, heavy industrial uses within that within that area existing. Okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll bend that map to include those in there. Okay. And then once we if you once the council adopts the ordinance text, uh, then we'll use what you've just said as the basis for going out to the to the business community and say this is what we're thinking about doing. Well, I, I want to make sure I understand this because we we happen to think of a couple of areas. I'm talking about. Everything that's zoned manufacturing now, not changing immediately, leaving it all M2, and taking the parcels right. one at a time, looking at them, and not, I don't want to be sitting there changing something over over there where I don't even know what's, what exists there. You know, we're going to be putting it on a map and saying, oh, yeah, this looks good, and, and yeah, without taking into consideration of businesses that are there. Because if you if you have that M one option for light industry, and we keep everything M two, what's over here? Then somebody could come and say, "Well, you know, I've got a light industry. What's over Can we there? go into an M two area?" Well, this is uh, seventy six and Hicks. This is a former commercial dry cleaner here. That the Hicks site. Okay, and then, that that's one you probably want to rezone. Yeah, right. I mean, I yeah. think that one we'd probably want. We may want to consider getting that out of manufacturing. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I agree. Well, maybe, maybe not. 
right you know, now you've what got right that depending the potential on potential yeah, of right. you know someone moving down yeah there. but then you've got the you know the h and m is it graphics uh, yep. over that's here? manufacturing it's manufacturing but i think that would qualify under our under light, uh, under, under light. light. okay yeah. that's so, good i mean and we can we'll take that's a closer look at that maybe we get a list of all the businesses in the city and that's and we that's what we a, that's what we have to do before yeah, we start so we've changing got, the zoning yeah we've kind of gone through this ourselves and look at it each business are uh, they have your light and we determine that they're, they're light and the ones of the yellow were the ones that were questionable and we added some other big just to make a larger area okay. and we'll get you the list of all those and, and what we think they should be and you can see what what we're thinking i, I think of you have to break it down on individual business by business by okay. aldermanic district so that the, the alderman in the <coughs> district can look at it and and they know better than <coughs> anyone else what they feel is right for we'll the district. It. They can get together, with, you know. Right. We'll do it. We'll do it that way. Then. Good. That, that'd be good. Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, back to. Okay. So that's that's all I have for the number twelve on good. your agenda. So if you were to adopt the the, the verbiage, the verbiage the then we'll come back with what you with said the verbiage should be, okay. and this is how we think that they would be, and then. We can rezone. And then the committee will reconvene and and. And I, I anticipate the rezoning process to be piecemeal and taking, maybe a year, year and a half, whatever, you know, whatever it takes for us to get it done. Right. There's I don't no, want to just jump in and do a mass thing. Just depends on who comes to you for God, looking up locating a location that's yeah industrial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Very good. Okay, item 13, discussion relative to nominal price retail store ordinance considerations, definitions, goals, separation clause. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, we we just want to discuss this this evening. Um, mm -hmm. I understand there's uh, some concern with, uh, you know, the, this type of use within the city and maybe are there some opportunities maybe to take a look at defining it and understanding it a little bit more and, and perhaps regulate it in a different way. Right now, we, we consider uh, the dollar store format uh, to be a retail use, which is permitted sure. pretty much across the board in any commercial zoning district. Um, uh, you know, in terms of national or our own, you know, city, we've got about six locations that would include the new, the new store, Dollar General, over in 76 and national. Um, but uh, about 39,000 uh, locations in the U.S., uh, about 325,000 employees nationally, Typical size ranges between you know six and it's under fifteen thousand square feet in general. Uh, here are the locations, the distribution within the city. Uh, the, the newest uh, store, which is under construction here on Seventy Six and National, we got two in the town center, one on Ninety Third or so in Greenfield, um, uh, in the South Town Shopping Center, and then over here on Seventy First and Lincoln. So some of the concerns are that you know it's going to take away in grocery local grocers. Um, won't be able to compete um, if if these stores proliferate and it's going to force these grocers to close and uh, uh, sales obviously would would drop um, at local grocery stores um, it could also limit the access to fresh food as grocery stores go away now you have less fresh produce for for people in the in the immediate area and then also the uh, employment could potentially decline if um, you know the typical grocer you can have, you know, upwards of, you know, numbers of people, um, and, and whereas a, a nominal price store has, is, employs far fewer persons than, a, you know, a pick and save or a Kroger, for instance. Um, so those are the those are the concerns, I guess, with the use. Um, and what we've we've looked at a few cities nationally, ranging from uh, Kansas City, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Mesquite, Texas, and. Um, there's some consistency, consistent um, uh, things that we, we looked at in their ordinances that sort of across the board, um, basically retail sales of variety of convenience items which are sold directly to consumer. Uh, majority of the merchandise or inventory is priced at, at or below uh, $10 per item. Floor areas are in general 12,000 square feet or less. And the consideration, some communities have actually considered separation clause where you put in a 3,000 foot or 1,500 foot separator between stores. You know whether that's measured door to door, whether that's measured property line to property line. But those are the consistent um, themes that have sort of come out in those in those three ordinances that we've we've looked at. Um, so if we take a look at a sample definition of how do we define this within our own municipality, um, 
you know, we call it a nominal price retail store. Perhaps it could be called a business with a floor of less than 12,000 square feet. Primarily it offers or advertises for sale to the public inexpensive general merchandise at a price of $10 per item or, or less, um, or something similar. Um, so, you know, the, the variables here um, in the definition, I'll admit, are, it can be a little tricky to define, but I mean, the numbers here, 12,000, I suppose that could be adjusted either up or down slightly. The price, the price point, I suppose that could also be adjusted. Um, but it's, I think it's a matter of the purpose. What is the, it, you know, if there is a, a will uh, for this type of ordinance, um, if there's a purpose that the council wants to achieve, I guess let us know and we'll, we'll try to shape it to something that, that works and um, bring it back to you for consideration. Well, I know, oh, no, I'm in yeah. the uh, Steve, you know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, dollar stores and mm -hmm. many of those stores have been coming into West Dallas in many communities. But basically, you know, those places, they didn't really provide any fresh food. So I go back then to the uh, gas stations. Yeah. Years ago, I remember, they didn't sell anything, you know. But today, in some way, they don't have the same thing what the dollar store has, but they sell the same junk stuff, you know. You know, basically, that's what, what's going on. So I don't know what's be the difference, really. I mean, so the, the, gross, the, the uh, gas stations, they do selling potato chips, and cigarettes, and everything else. So what's really the difference between the dollar stores and that? The dollar store, yeah. I mean, they have a more yeah. product, you know, like. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's true, Vince. I mean, the gas stations will sell convenience items at a, uh, you know, a price. Uh, but I think this is the, the difference is that the gas station convenience store is the principal use there is the gas station. You're, you're going there to get fuel, and then while you're there, maybe you'll, you'll run in and grab a couple convenience items. Yes. This the nominal price retail store is purely based on we're a retail store and this is our model. You know, it's it's a certain price point or less for a certain square footage and this is this is all we do. You know, we don't sell fuel. We're just we're focused on convenience items at a at a very low rate. So the concern is that that could potentially undercut, say for instance, like local grocers and and then limit um, employment opportunities at those grocers reduce sales at grocery stores, and then ultimately if that drives grocers out of town, you lose an opportunity to go get, you know, fresh produce at, uh, at the, the local store. Madam Chair? I will. Yeah. Okay. I'll miss I've, I've had a big problem with the one going on 76 in Nashville, and everybody knows that. Um, I think the, my biggest problem with this is we're trying to re-image 70th to 84th Street on National Avenue, and what do we do? A Dollar General goes in there. To me, that's not a re-image store mm -hmm. that should be going into a location like that. Mm -hmm. So if there's something that we can prevent in the areas that we want to re-image the city, in those areas, we have something on there that keeps those things from going in. Um, I've gone into some of these stores a number of times just out of curiosity, and I've found expired food, and they're selling it. Is there a way for us to... Con to do something with that. The health department regulates you know, it. That's, that's yeah. what I'm wondering is, that, is there something that with that? Um, that's my biggest concern with this thing is, is where we're trying, where they're putting it. And I agree with Alderman Stefanski. I, I'm concerned about the image when you get a proliferation yes. of, of those type of stores and the check hashing outfits and, and the, the pay, payday loan places. Um, it's a city on the decline, not on the, not on the upswing. And I, I want to make sure that, that we prohibit, um, or, or not prohibit, but Slow limit the, it, uh, the uh, limit uh, expansion of, of those types of businesses or the proliferation of them. Um, you get, you, know, you got two of those stores in a town center now, you get a, a check action place and a payday loan store in there, and what's the town center? Garbage. Yeah. You know, you don't want that. You know, Rosalie, you just got, she like you just got a nice tenant she in the Hobby them. Lobby. Oh no! And, and I made a resolution. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. I know. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You know, I like. I don't want to see Rapina's hurt. Rapina's a great business yeah. here in the city, and yeah. now we got a dollar general. You're going to bring in food here, and that's going to affect Rapina's. That's that's not pretty beneficial to us, I think. Okay. Well, would we include uh, the number of employees as well, and something like that? Um, I. Or I not don't know. necessarily. I don't know. That might be. 
Uh, you, you, I suppose we could consider anything, but I want to maybe talk. To yeah. Maybe, maybe you look yeah. at this thing as a, 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 a in combination with the check cashing places and okay. and and the payday loan stores, and say um, any one of those types of uses has to be X number of feet from another existing one, and limit them to you know so many in a, in a certain area. Like you take the downtown business district, you don't want five of those stores in the downtown business district or even two of them. Yeah. So less yeah. than like square that. miles yeah. Yeah. Like apart. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But especially not in a place we're trying to re-image stuff, right. you know? Exactly. Okay. The, the one on 76 in National, though, that's bigger than 12,000 square feet, oh, yeah, isn't it? It's got to be. Uh, yeah, it's about 8,000. Is it really? Really? Yeah. I mean, well, they're, so they're going to that store door. up? Yeah, they're, no, they're going to take, I mean, pretty much the entire family video store is about 8,000 feet, and then family video is actually going to slide over to where Subway used to be. Yeah. And then the pizza place is still there, yeah, still. but it's about eight thousand feet. Yeah, it's all yeah. Oh, yeah. bigger than that. I thought yeah. it was bigger. Yeah, me too. Cool I'm store was there. bigger when I mean, it was I there. Just, right. Last time I was in there it was cool. <laughs> yeah. Family yeah. Videos. Right. 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 I can't believe that. Yeah. yeah, who uses those? The window That's film. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> who uses those things? By the way, the window film on the Dollar General is going to come off. It's just up there. The, the corporate window film guy nationally came through and, and pasted this one up, but he didn't know that we had already worked out an arrangement with uh, Dollar General not to put that stuff up. It's just up there during the term of construction right now. When okay. they're done with that, before they get occupancy, that's coming off per our approved plan. Yes, so, yeah. totally. Fortunately, we had a good ordinance in effect, a good side ordinance in yeah. effect. <clears throat> Any more discussion on this? I think it's moved forward. Good. Um, item 14, discussion relative to 116th and Morgan, soil Sorry. and groundwater, 8 to 10 borings. Thank you. I think I jumped yeah, you did. You're good, though. Yes. Uh, one of the things that we we're always concerned about, uh, we heard that there was either incinerator rash, garbage, or white goods, uh, stoves, refrigerators that had been thrown in there over the years. The investigation we did today did not find any of that. Uh, so this site is relatively good. It's got some fill, but you can build on fill. There's some petroleum products in here, and that's not bad. We could deal with that. So the, the point being is that this first round uh, dissuaded uh, a lot of the rumors that said this site was unbuildable. So now that we found this out, we'll continue to fully characterize it, the vertical and horizontal instead of any contamination, so we get DNR clearance so the city could do with it whatever they please in the future. Uh, and then that now it's open for whatever you want to do. Now we're going to be putting some more money, uh, like, like for example here we found some petroleum. Uh, what we have to do now is to go outside of that, step out, and then do four more borings around that until we fully characterized where that is. And some, some of these will look kind of strange, but, uh, and then we'll, we'll, most of the remedies is just going to be capping it. How difficult is it to get rid of that? It depends on what kind of petroleum products that are in there. Some of that will, we can use natural attenuation. Some of that will take, will have to actually take out hot spot removal. Okay. Some of them may take a little bit longer, uh, where they, slowly attenuate it through a sock for over by CNH distributors there was a <coughs> oil at the ground there that we had to use a sock to soak up 17 years we did that but we got the building to built and we kept doing it once a year they pull up the sock put a new sock in and finally DNR said you're fine you're good wow but we kept we didn't wait for it to get all done we got clearance to, to keep moving so gotcha. I don't expect that but we'll still have we still have to work out uh, a funding source as to how to fund the remaining remediation. Right now, we're using our community economic development fund, which is going to run out in the not too distant future. But we'll talk about that. But the good news is, is that we've got our hands around this, and that whatever the city should decide in the future how they want to use that, it's available in their arsenal to use. Right. Potential is we can build on it sometime, maybe get it back on the tax rolls. Yeah, exactly. I'm against it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I want it on the tax rolls. <laughs> That's a lot of tax money there. Um, item E, consideration relative to the report on redevelopment initiatives. Mr. Stiebel, yes. any updates on any of Perfect. these? I'm just gonna... Just 
real quick. I only put one thing in here uh, for discussion. The rest can be talked about. Is the Highway 100 study? Um, we've hired Ginsler, the council, Common Council selected Ginsler, contracted with uh, Ginsler to provide a Highway 100 study. They've been working on it. We've completed the focus group sessions um, in which we had representatives of the corridor, business owners, aldermen, and uh, thank you for your time if you participated in those discussions um, and collected a, a, some information. Um, this is just kind of the result of those focus groups hitting some of the key areas, some of the topics that came up, and it was a broad um, discussion of the, the area. So on October 17th at 6 p.m. at Irving, we'll be having a workshop where they'll talk about the focus group, what they've reached in ter terms of some conclusions, and then um, and also have some working sessions there to help work towards finalization of a report that would be produced by early December. One of the things that we did was also a survey that went to the aldermen of the district um, that to share with constituents, neighborhood associations, as well as next door, and we received 231 responses. And the you know, early results of that survey, this is a, sur a chart that shows what, what's the reason you go to Highway 100, the purpose of your visit. Pretty, pretty um, clear what those are, dining, shopping, just it's nice to see what, what people are going to Highway 100 for. What are the two top two primary concerns when thinking about this area? Now, this isn't scientific in any way yet. We, haven't, we have a lot of data, and there's a lot of comments. This, the report is actually like 35 pages long, what came out of the survey. And I just bring what people are saying are the top issues, and traffic came up. The important thing is that public safety is whether it's getting in and out of the traffic or, or what that, it's not necessarily shootings or something like that, but just. But we, had, we have a number of pages of comments. I'm just, I share that with you just to show that we are having some progress, and then on the 17th, we'll have that, that workshop, and then there will be another workshop in early November. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I also think I, I thought about that a little bit on that public safety thing. And somebody said that, well, um, at CDA last night, we've eliminated cruising. Well, that's not true. It's cruising not true. is still, it's, still it's not what it used yeah. to be, right. but it is still there. And um, I think people's public safety is not during the day. I think it's on the weekends um, after the sun goes down that that might not be the safest road to be on at that particular time. So I think that big line that came out really can pinpoint still to the cruising issue that is still there that we you know we continue to try to get our hands around and that was but <clears throat> addressed to the neighbors there mm -hmm. not to anybody yeah. else in the city that's and going there to shop and things right. so right. you're getting the attitude of the people in the neighborhood that don't like the cruising correct that are putting up with the cruisers and and the, mm -hmm. the noise and that so yeah for them it's a safety issue yes i don't think anybody I'm, i haven't heard of anybody that's uh, doesn't go shopping on Highway 100 because they're afraid of getting robbed or anything. Exactly. Or, you know, mm -hmm. carjacked. Yeah. You know, that's not the case. No, I think it, it's, it's related to the yeah, cruising it's a, still. It's a cruising. Anybody else have any other questions? If not, uh, we, we're ready to go into closed session. Okay. Um, is there a motion to go into closed session for I'll make a motion. Two to that's second. Second. Closed session. Okay, okay. Alderman Stefanski. I make most of it going yeah, to close. I, I know we need aye. Uh, I've got to say aye. take a verbal vote. You say aye. We're doing aye. a vote now. Oh, sorry, aye. Yep. <laughs> Alderman Vitelli. Aye. Alderman uh, uh, Ranky. Aye. Barzak. And the chair votes aye. When we go into closed session, we have to take